Okay, well, let's start with Putin's reaction to Trump's victory. So, the Russian government has worked pretty hard to get Donald Trump elected uh, this election, but not only just get Donald Trump elected, because uh, there has been misinformation spread from their bot farms doing their best to get him elected on social media and other platforms. I don't know how much of an impact it actually had at the end of the day. Like, I think if you remove all of it, it's hard to say exactly how it would have affected the race, but I don't think it was the main deciding factor. It was a factor in some place and somewhere. I just don't think it was the main deciding one, but they did try, they did try. And so if they worked so hard to get him elected, then they probably did it under the idea of some reciprocation of something, either that he would take a better position in other country or otherwise. But Putin himself, once asked after Donald Trump won the race, did not seem that outwardly excited and did not, you know, spring with glee and smile and clap his hands. And I think this is for a few reasons. Uh, number one, I think that it has to do with uh, keeping up appearances. Uh, I think that even if he is super excited, obviously, if he goes out and say, yay, woohoo, we will now win a thousand years like, because Putin and Trump sitting in the tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, if he starts saying that, that's probably going to undercut Trump's ability to actually give him a favorable deal because then there'll be so much domestic political pressure against Trump being a stooge for Putin because, you know, the media is already preempted to that imagery that it'll be hard for him to make a deal. In fact, Putin has tried to control for this in the past. When Donald Trump, as confirmed by Bob Woodward's new book, War, as reported in this book, when Donald Trump sent Putin COVID machines for his personal health after Putin asked for it, he told him to be quiet about it out of fear of political repercussion for Trump domestically. So this is something that is proven that Putin is looking out for on behalf of Donald Trump when it comes to their deal making and Donald Trump previously looking out for Putin's health. So I, I, I'm not pulling this out of nowhere. I think that there is a reported history of this that makes this a sneaking suspicion that I'm still having that could be the purpose of this. And I think the other reason is, um, uh, I, but I do think this is part of it. I think the other reason is they really don't know which way Trump's gonna go. And I saw this one quote from Russian state media describing Trump, and I think it shows why they would want President Trump over President Harris, while at the same time leaves them with lingering uncertainty. Uh, they describe Donald Trump like an unguided missile. You just don't know where he's going to end up. He could end up cutting off all aid to the Ukrainians, frustrated with their uh, insistence that they get their land back or something along those lines, and then the Russians are in a better strategic position overall. Or it could be the Russians ask for too much, according to Trump's uh, calculations, for him to have his own PR win. Uh, the Russians act incredulously, or they act imprudently in a way that is received poorly by Trump. And Zelensky's on his A game when it comes to his, you know, smooching and, you know, you know, trying to get Trump on his side. And then Trump actually increases aid to Ukraine to try to have a peace through strength foreign policy that he talks about so much and that Zelensky seems eager to jump upon. And so in a way, Trump is an unguided missile. You really don't know where he's going to end up. It's the one thing that I agree with Russian state media on. And so on one hand, I see a certain amount of smoozing towards Trump. Here's an example of him at this conference take, saying that Donald Trump is a real man and courageous. And he learned this from the assassination attempt. So this is, you know, KGB smoozing. He's trying to, you know, get his favor. But first of all, I can tell you by his behavior at that moment during the attempt on his life impressed me. He turned out to be a courageous man. And it's not just about raising his hand and calling for the fight for their common ideals. It's not just about that. Although, of course, you know, it was done in the heat of the moment. A person shows himself in extraordinary circumstances, courageously, like a man. This is the type of stuff that knows how to perfectly at Trump's ego, and I think that's the purpose of it. But the other thing a is, is a curd. he's already right Home away. Protection fund. Hey, thank you for the $5, JP. I'll put that towards soft body armor. He's also setting the stages 
for prickly diplomacy right off the bat. Here is Vladimir Putin saying uh, that he will not call Trump. Trump will have to call him. Uh, and I think from the Russian standpoint, Trump calling him would be an admission of weakness, that he is the one that needs to end the war because he made the promise. Therefore, it's on him to convince the Russians to end it, not the Russians on them to convince him to end it. Therefore, Trump's the one coming with conciliatory concessions, not Putin. At least that's the mentality behind it. It seems like a tiny thing. Trump calls them or they call Trump. But to someone like Putin, that could actually have some significance, at least when it comes to the mindset that they're entering negotiations with. What he said about the desire to rebuild relations with Russia. Oh, sorry in English. An end to the Ukrainian crisis. I think this deserves attention at the very least. And I would like to take this opportunity to offer my congratulations on his election as president of the United States. And if he does what he has been promising, you know, uh, before the inauguration, if he makes a phone call, if he says, Vladimir, let's meet, you know, I wouldn't be, I don't think it would be beneath me to call him myself. But again, I think something important here is that Trump making that first phone call. And while that seems tiny, I I do think from the Russians diplomatically, it holds significance. Uh, and Trump, I think, might be willing to do it. But on the other hand, something like that, if Trump was to hear word of this, like, wait, they want me to call him? He has every reason for this war to end as much as we do. No, he has to call me. Like, Trump, these tiny things like that is, I don't see it as difficult for Trump to get caught up on stuff like that. And Zelensky to go in there and be like, Hey, man, he wants you to call him as an, a sign of weakness. We need to go in there with strength. You don't want to be weak in any negotiation. America should be strong. Your presidency should be strong. The smoothing and the moving and the shaking, that's what we need to see from Zelensky. We need to see Zelensky's best Ukraine wood performance, okay? Ukrainian Hollywood. We need to see the best acting from Zelensky's career of, okay, man, Obama was woke. Biden was cringe. You can be so based, Mr. Trump. You can be so based. You can be so based. Okay, let's move forward to one last thing that Putin said during this conference that I do think is of note. And that is Putin not only congratulating Trump, like we just said, but Putin also during this uh, meeting said in reaction to the election, and I think it's kind of obvious it was a reaction to the election, at least partially, that he is building a new world order. Let's listen to that briefly before we talk about it and wrap up our segment of how Putin's reacting to it. Elect Trump revealing he has not spoken with Vladimir Putin since his victory as he receives a flood of calls from world leaders. The Russian president, though, publicly praising Trump for his bravery during the assassination attempt in Butler, Pennsylvania. Putin speaking today saying, quote, he behaved, in my opinion, in a very correct way, courageously, like a real man. Fred Plaikin is out front. After launching a massive attack aimed at the heart of Kyiv, Russian leader Vladimir Putin praising President-elect Donald Trump. I would like to take this opportunity to offer my congratulations on his election as president of the United States, Putin says. So you're willing to talk to Trump, the moderator asks? Yes, we're ready, Putin says. Indeed, President-elect Trump seems willing to talk to Putin as well. Legendary journalist Bob Woodward writing in a recent book that the two men have had a number of phone calls up to seven since Trump left office. Trump reportedly gifting Putin COVID tests in the early days of the pandemic when those tests were scarce. And Trump himself has often praised his relations with the Russian president, even siding with Vladimir Putin over the U.S.'s own intelligence services after Russia's interference in the 2016 presidential election. My people came to me, Dan Coates came to me and some others. They said they think it's Russia. Uh, I have uh, President Putin. Uh, he just said it's not Russia. I will say this. I don't see any reason why it would be. As Russia continues its full-on invasion of Ukraine, gaining ground especially on the Eastern Front, the president-elect still saying he'd be able to end the war fast. They're dying, Russians and Ukrainians. I want them to stop dying. And I'll have that done, I'll have that done in 24 hours. 
if we had a real president, the president that knew, that was respected by Putin, he would have never, he would have never invaded Ukraine. But the Ukrainians fear Trump might cut off military aid to Ukraine altogether, forcing the country into a de facto surrender and loss of territory. Every time Zelensky comes to the United States, he walks away with $100 billion. I mean, there, Trump did so much irreversible damage to Ukraine by making this a partisan issue. Trump could have united both sides on supporting Ukraine and kept the pressure on specifically to counter like Russian control claims around him and him being a Putinist. He could have done that. He could have made this a diplomatic, like a, like a political gain for him. He could have tried to pressure Biden on being weak on long range strikes and Trump would be strong and, and he'd go up there and be a strong man like Putin and look up, look him in the eye and threaten to do more and get a good deal. But no, instead, instead of adding pressure on Biden to do more, instead of attacking him for being weak on Ukraine, this is what we've gotten instead. And instead of having bipartisan support for like clean aid to Ukraine, we got delays. We got delays. We got lack of pressure on the Biden administration from the opposition, from an opposition within the Republican Party that would be prone to and has a history of pressuring Democratic presidents for not being strong enough on foreign policy. Instead, we got no pressure. Instead, we got aid delays. And instead, we got the undermining of our own leverage. I think he's the greatest salesman on earth. But we're stuck in that war unless I'm president. And when pressed to answer whether he even wants Ukraine to win the war, Trump simply won't say. I want the war to stop. I want to save lives. And you know, Aaron, Russian leader Vladimir Putin also saying that if Donald Trump were to call him and say, hey, Vladimir, let's meet up, he certainly wouldn't be averse to doing that. In general, the Russians are saying that they are looking for countries to call them and reestablish relations. Aaron. All right, Fred, thank you very much. And I want to go now to Fareed Zakaria, host of Fareed Zakaria GPS. So Fareed Trump wins, Putin comes out and hails a, quote, completely new world order. Is it? Well, what Putin was talking about there was uh, a completely new world order in which American power is declining, in which Western power is declining, and as he sees it, Russia and China and countries like Iran are ascendant. So it's a very particular uh, version of a new world order. And I would find it very difficult to imagine that any American president would sign on to that new world order. So, But I mean, hey, you know, give him a big victory for it right off the bat. First crisis of your presidency. And I got to I got to emphasize that again. This will be the first crisis of Trump's presidency. He will become president. He will have not been able to achieve peace, I think, before becoming president. He will try to call them both, try to make some deal, and either we're going to get Ukraine getting cut off from aid because they were not able to accept all of the territorial concessions that were asked for them. Uh, we, are, we could get uh, Ukraine being given a timetable for the shrinking of aid. We could get like a, a complete revamping of aid being turned into a gigantic uh, land lease programs if we're getting Mike Pompeo's proposal. We could get Trump angry at the Russians and ever feeling rebuked by them, not willing to accept what he thought was a fair deal. And then we get a reversal from Trump. I mean, we could get anything. I mean, it's going to be the first crisis of his presidency. And you want to know what sucks about it is I don't think the alt media space is ready to cover it. I don't think they're ready to cover it at all. And all the pressure that should be the first wave of opposition thrown at uh, Donald Trump, I think the alt media space is going to be tapped out on. I mean, I think there'll be some, but I think it's honestly going to be up to the <laughs> going to be up to the Dems in Congress, which gives me a ton of concern. Maybe John Oliver will do a segment and we'll get lucky. <laughs> no bueno, no bueno. Let's listen to Russian State TV and their uh, estimation on the odds of success on American-Russian negotiations over peace. The main question during today's discussions are perhaps understandable. The special military operation, Ukraine's future, and the main thing the whole world is concerned with is naturally the American elections. 
The West has lost its independence, has been waiting for two days for Putin to call the city upon a hill, to congratulate Trump with his election victory. The British are perturbed more than others. Channel Sky News reported that the Russian president already congratulated Donald, not directly, but through common friends. The Kremlin called these reports nonsense and a fake. According to Dmitry Peskov, Putin's press person, Putin and Trump may talk before the inauguration, but for now there are no plans to do so. Moscow positions hasn't changed. Russia still considers the United States a hostile nation. Despite everything Trump said about aid to Ukraine, it doesn't anticipate any changes to U.S. foreign policy. Trump is a nightmare for Ukraine. The Wall Street Journal is publishing the first insight that the 47th U.S. president will demand that Zelensky abandon any attempt to join NATO for 20 years. In exchange, Donald will agree to supply weapons. Otherwise, he will cut off the supply of funds and abandon Ukraine. The British Guardian writes that Putin will not give up his demands. German De Welt writes that Moscow has no reason to sit down at the negotiating table. Russia's armies continue to advance and is liberating Donbass. I mean, it's just like, they see, this is being used as an example of Western weakness. This is what is being turned into. Look, the West is fighting amongst itself. Look, Washington's making demands of the Ukrainians. Look, the Western media say that the Russians have no reason to negotiate. We're advancing, we're advancing, we're advancing. We're the ones negotiating for the position of strength. The Americans have to negotiate with us. They have to call us. They're trying to set the pretext. It's part of the reason why they're putting so much battlefield pressure now to put Trump in the worst position to negotiate, at least from their perspective when it comes to leverage. Now, Trump could just choose to reject that framing and say, I see the weakness in your military production. I see the weakness in your economy. I am more than willing to strengthen the terror, uh, the, the sanctions. I'm, But I haven't seen that rhetoric from him. And so as of right now, I am still very concerned that this is the exact framing that Trump's going to play into. And that's going to lead to them saying, we'll just give up Kursk. In exchange, you'll get weapons. Let them keep the occupied land. And maybe we'll talk about NATO membership in 30 years. Mark Rutt, NATO Sec Secretary General, is said that if Trump plans to stop supporting Ukraine, Putin will win and conquer all of Ukraine. And after that, enthusiastic and very angry, Russia will show up at the EU's borders. Having added Ukraine's army to its own, this sounds like a tremendous plan. <laughs> it was, it's, it's, the leader of NATO is writing out like a doomsday scenario where American support ends, the Russians keep advancing, they take over Ukraine, they're now at the gates of Europe, now they will add Ukraine to its resource, to its population, to attack these other countries, and this is like his doomsday scenarios writing out why the American public's like, nah, nah, that's all nonsense. That's never going to really happen. They get the Russian state TV and they're like, oh man, that sounds awesome. More, more. Yes, immediately, immediately. Yes, yes. Based, based, based. Rutt is warning Washington that Moscow's actions threaten not only Europeans, but also the United States. In exchange for people, Russia is supposedly providing its latest missile technologies to North Korea. NATO Secretary General said he is planning to personally discuss this issue with Donald Trump. Trump is the sole U.S. president who met with Kim calling him Rocket Man. Pyongyang no longer needs pointless discussions with the President of America. North Korea now has a Russia as a strategic partner. This It is true now that the Russians and North Koreans have a closer relationship and the Russians are helping to provide the North Korean sanctions relief, which means that the North Koreans are in a stronger negotiating position than they were during Trump's first term. And I think the odds of Trump getting any big concessions from them are very, very low. 
Um, and if they are going to get big concessions out of them, it would probably have to be through the weakening of where they're getting all this new leverage, which would mean the Russians, which would mean more pressure in Ukraine, which is still highly, highly debatable if this administration is going to take that seriously, which I mean, <laughs> I didn't vote for him. While maintaining China's support, Pyongyang will keep moving forward towards its nuclear frontiers. Oh, cool. They have a fan edit for North Korea's Atomic L. That's great. Imagine if CNN had like a dubstep edit for blowing up Moscow. <laughs> what editing? Well, at least we know that we have moderates over there in Russian media to, you know, help reel in the Russian public. Hey, why, why do you... Why do you think Russian, uh, why did that music just start? Why do you think Russian soldiers keep committing war crimes? What type of media space could make them dehumanize Ukrainians? Hmm. Hmm. Human safari, you say? Where did that come from? What was that old COD 360 montage? Look, okay. When you can control critique of the government and the media, you don't need to put that much thought into your propaganda. You can just have fun with it. And that's what they're doing. They're just having fun with it, okay? You're going to really critique them for just having fun with it? Come on, leave them alone. Let, let them make their propaganda in peace. Okay, let's move on. Do -do -do -do. 